13, and then I will catch up with you in John chapter 13. Moving towards the cross. Man, hallelujah. Boy, I tell you what, when sometimes you get caught in, you know, some of you know that I, uh, on Facebook, you saw we were with Tammy and Steve Love, David Forsyth. It just happened to be a divine appointment, appointment for all of that to take place. Good stuff. Uh, thought about, man, I'm, I had, you know, when you go through a storm like I went through, I kind of had my wife put with me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, because, you know, married man should get his mistake because there's no use to two people remembering the same thing. Man, I kind of felt that way that that was going to happen if you've been up there with me. But Corinthians, I just want to read so beautiful. And it says, if I speak in tongues and in tongues, I don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a symbol. If I have a gift of prophecy, I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. If I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. It almost implies you could have faith to move mountains and not have love. It almost implies you could have wisdom to understand mystery, don't have love. Think that the kids don't think you guys it. If I have faith that move mountains, if I give all I possess towards friend my body flame, I don't have love. Nothing. Love is patient, kind, not in does not boast, not proud, not rude, not self not easy to hang. No record of wrong. Love does not delight but rejoice Truth. Love protects, trust, hope, perseveres. Love never fails. Probably at God is love. You understand that God is love, you're going to understand Go. Because Paul adds this, I think mean, it's so important to remind yourself what love is. Amen. Because what I'm seeing a lot of social media in the world right now is not love. Man, hate, apathy, all these things that they so I want to get back to this to love. Lord bless our children. No, I don't. All of them are gone on the break. Oh, they're already back there? Park, they already left. We've had a great time for the past. Understand it's fast. fast. When you speak on the subject of love, it's the essence of God. Him, actually. You've got to consider spontaneity. Lack of prejudice. Love doesn't have prejudice. In our modern day society, it's actually where it's lost much impact. God had a staff for it. Love, it really is not love. It goes wrong, they no longer love. Love has the way of lasting impact. It's the most powerful force in the world. For God to find it as love, and that God so loved us that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him does not perish and have everlasting life. It's portrayed in Corinthians, just read, you know, now by faith, hope, and love. And it just goes ahead and says, the greatest of these is love. Many people don't like to compare things like this because they say, you know, it's not fair. I know that fair place, fair feels punk poop. Amen. So life is not fair. Can I get an amen? But I'm going to tell you, the greatest is love. John chapter 13, are you comfortable? John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Amen. His hour. Remember last week we talked about the expiration of the hour, that his hour was going to expire, that he knew that it was going to happen. It says here that when he knew that his hour would come, he'd depart out of this world unto the Father. He didn't say he'd die. He said, I'm departing. And I use these words all the time in my life. Not that I would die, but that I would depart. Not that I was born, but God sent me. Amen. But it changes the way you think. Amen. It helps you understand you're not a mistake, that you were meant to be here at the time for this purpose and for this reason. Amen. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. He loved his own that was in the world. And that's where we're at. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Can get me, man? We hear. Amen. God put us here. We're not going to get to stay here. So I thank God. Christian said it this way. He showed them the full extent of his love with a footnote that reads, he loved them to the last. P.S. 
he loved them to the last. The Amplified said he loved them to the last and to the highest degree. The message the Bible says, having loved your companions, he continued to love them right up to the end. Barclay said he decided to show them what his love was like in a way which went to the ultimate limit. Amen. Father, thank you for your love. I thank you for that. It has no limit. That you keep loving us, give us mercy to every morning. We thank you. We, we bathe in it today. Lord, we relish in it. We roll over in it like a puppy in the sunshine, thanking you for your love. In Jesus' name. And everyone shout, amen. God bless you. The writer of this is out of the book of John. So we know who John was, his words, amen. When he shared about him, he shared the extent. He was a witness to it. After all, it was the apostle John who on more than one occasion referred to himself as the one who Jesus loved. He meant oftentimes you'll meet people that say, I'm God's favorite. I say it all the time. Amen. You can say whatever you want, but I tell you, I'm God's favorite. I show up at a gas station, other people show up. I walk into a restaurant alone, and that place will fill up. Why is that? Because favor follows whoever's favoring the Father. Amen. And so I just claim that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Just like John said, hey, I'm the one, I, I, I'm the one who Jesus loved. Now, surely he loved Peter. Surely he loved John's brother, James. But John stamped himself, and he said, you know what, if I had to say it. And there are those of you that will tell people all over the world, my mama loved me the most. You'll do it. Amen. I say it all the time. I, I'm mama's favorite. Amen. I was daddy's Well, sometimes I was daddy's I knew my mama loved me. Hallelujah. She always bought me potato chips, hid them from everybody else. That has to be love. Amen. From this perspective, he tells us what went on in that room of destiny. Amen. Just before the crucifixion, his story includes monumental expression of Christ's love by pointing out certain streets. And he keeps talking about an interruption. And it's always going to be things that interrupt. You'll watch it interrupt you. COVID has interrupt people. I, uh, my son and I walked through this place called the, the uh, Garden of the Gods. The snow was everywhere. It was beautiful. And as I'm walking through the place, there were people, I'm in the Rock Mountain. My mask is not on. I'm sucking in clean mountain air. Hallelujah. I mean the place, it's the garden of gods. It's beautiful. And people three, four hundred yards away from me walking by themselves with a mask on. And I get up close to them, and they peer off the trail to keep from getting near me. COVID stopped people from connecting and loving one another. I was with a lady on the plane. She said, don't. Me, I've had my shot. I said, that's good. Why are you wearing your mask? Because they told me. I said, who are they? You know they. I haven't, I, well, I've met quite a few things lately. Amen. But it just hit me how much that thing caused people to quit loving, caring, or connecting with one another. Amen. We got to get, we got to pass Mike telling me, stay, stay on the phone. He said, man, we're fixing to have a, a reunion. And a lot of my family, they can't wait to get their shot. And I'm not against them. shot. Say whatever shot you want. I got a vet back in the back. Took your shot. Amen. We'll make sure you don't get rabies or anything else later. Hallelujah. But he said, all my family, all of my wife's family, got to take their shots. And he said, but they're scared. We haven't taken our shot. That's what well, Pastor. If they take their shot, why do they care if you take yours? He said, that's the point. They're afraid because they've taken theirs. We haven't taken ours. Somehow we're going to affect them. It doesn't. How many realize that a lot of this ain't making no sense? Amen. How many realize science changed a whole lot over the last 12 months? And it keeps shifting. It keeps changing. It is driving people apart. But I'm going to tell you, through all the interruptions of life, amen, you see that Jesus kept right on loving. His first possible interruption was for the Feast of the Passover. It's the greatest day of celebration to the Jewish race, the time of, of joy. It reflected everybody being gathered together there in Jerusalem. It reflected on the day that the angel of death passed over because of the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Many of us at the time last year, including myself, put red bandanas over my door. I prayed over them. I quoted Psalm 91, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. I, I read out of Exodus chapter 32, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. I put it like a symbol over my door. It's still there today. Red bandanas reminding myself, that God's looking after me no matter what. Can I get an amen? And so this was that celebration. It was this, the, the people gathering. It brought families together. Last week we talked about the Greeks that came together, the Gentiles, and they said, Lord, we want to see you. 
We want to see Jesus during this time. Amen. It brought these people together. Holidays are always days of interrupted, the daily routines. And would this interruption cause Jesus to back away? Amen. Or be, you know, listen, he was the blood. He was the blood over the doorpost. He symbolized his blood over the doorpost. And here he is, and my friend, but he still loved them. There was another inter interruption. Jesus knew that his hour had come. When you think about death, and you got a, a heads up like Jesus did, and you realize that pretty soon you're going to be in a garden. Pretty soon you're going to be pleading with God to let the cup pass. You're going to be beaten. You're going to be uh, crucified onto a cross. You know that it's going to happen. It's your hour. Jesus answered him saying, the hour has come. I understand my time is out. The sand has ran through the hourglass. I'm going to be glorified. He knew it. He discerned it clearly. His day, his instant, amen, for this season was there. The hour represented the crucible of his life. The whole reason that I came to earth was for this moment. He knew it would eventually arrive. It's here. Last week I talked to you about it. If there are times in life that you know that it's coming, you can't stop it. Amen. The, the body's going to give way. The earth suit will give back to the earth, and your spirit will go on to be with him. He faced the event that would divide time. It's going to go down in history. It's something every soul would have to acknowledge. This year, in the next few weeks, everyone will acknowledge. I don't care if it's with a bunny. I don't care if it's with a piece of chocolate. But somebody everywhere is going to uh, say, it's Easter. And eventually, somebody's going to say, what is Easter about? When I was a kid, it was about the bunny. When I was a kid, it was about hunting eggs. I had no idea what Easter was about. But finally, somebody reminded me, Easter is about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins, and he resurrected on the third day. Everybody's got to take knowledge, and they've got to see that again, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when I realized this, it was the apex of his destiny. Would face in this frenzy of emotion. No, don't tell me it's not emotion. I've been with enough people that have passed this life. It's emotion. It's emotional for those that are left. It's emotional for the one that's dying. And Jesus knew it. And he's going to say some things at the end. He's going to give seven sayings you know, while he's on the cross to direct people in destiny and to help them. The scripture says he loved them unto the end. The next interruption we realize is that supper being ended, the, the scripture says the devil having now put into the heart of Judas and Jairus, Simon's son to betray him. Verse 11 says, for Jesus knew who would betray him, Therefore said, you're not all, uh, you're not all clean. You've got to remember that they all come in and they, they gather around and he's given the bread, he's given the wine. It's communion. It's, what do we do during communion? We cleanse the soul. We ask for forgiveness. We remind ourselves that the, the bread was for the breaking of the body, the cup was the blood, the man that covered our sin. Jesus is doing that among the, the disciples. I've often told you they laid head to foot, head to foot, head to foot all the way around in the table. They stink feet in the room. Amen. And during that time, Jesus begins to acknowledge that one of them is going to betray him. He, this, it did not catch him by surprise. He knew when he picked Judas that Judas had this inclination about thievery, that Judas had a selfishness about him. And though he saw uh, the lepers being cleansed, Lazarus being raised, and a, and a woman with issue of blood being healed, and Jairus' daughter being raised, and all these miracles that he saw, it still didn't change him. And it's amazing how many people can see the great things of God, and yet their hearts still be inclined toward evil. And so here at this moment, he faced something that he had never experienced, a rejection from a friend, a betrayal. That it literally means to give over or to give up to help the enemy. We see the Savior forsaking the festival here, facing his hour, being betrayed by a friend, and yet his love still remains. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 7, says, Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers, were there rivers of blood, cannot wash it away. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. You can't buy love. You can't buy it. You can buy a lot of things. You can buy feelings. Amen. You can buy emotions in different areas. You can't buy love. You just love. Yeah. And when you feel with God, you just end up loving people. Uh, so water is the word water is there. Juice, things that are squeezed or extracted by pressure. They can't, they can't take love away. You know, we've been, we've been hit by floods, literal floods. And it didn't take love away. You know what it did? It forced us to love one another more. Amen. We found ourselves helping other people because of love. You know what love did in your life? Amen. It caused you to love the unlovable. Amen. To help those that you know aren't going to help you back. 
That word blood, things that flow together as a force against you. Would the blow of the disloyalty of this I almost a decoy type. He, he's he, the decoy. He's not for real here. Would that take him away? He loved them unto the end. The blood of betrayal, the waters of festivity, the anguish of the hour, it's not going to stop him from loving them. When friendships go sideways, when families go sideways, you've got to fight through it. You know, you do whatever you need to resolve it, but for God's sake, don't let the love of your life die. Amen. Stay with it. There are going to be people that are going to test you. There's going to be a celebration that are going to... I, I love the scripture that says that those that don't... That, remember that proverb. That those that can't hang out with you during your rough times have no business to celebrate with you. Amen. I found that true. So here it says, John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus said, I hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to remove them or pluck them out of my Father's hand. You know, he's careful to love what the Father gave him. You have to believe it in your heart that God gave you. Amen. To Jesus. And there's no way that he, I've often used this phrase, his grip don't slip. Amen. When he gets hold of you, he, I don't hold on to his hand because my grip will slip, but his don't. So when he grabs hold of my hand, he got me. And I want to tell you, as I was driving through that blizzard, I was reminding myself and reminding God, Lord, I am your child. Amen. I don't know about all the knuckleheads in this car. I love them. They're my family. But the truth of the matter is, I am your child. But that's why my son said, Dad, all I heard was you praying. That's right. I was reminding God who I was. Amen. I'm your favorite in this Toyota Camry. Hello. Amen. Front wheel drive, sliding up this hill, slipping all over the road. Jesus, take the wheel. Amen. That's what I was doing. Amen. That's, that's what you got to do. So I understood God gave me to Jesus. He chose them. You know, these were his own. Now you've got to make up your mind. Do I belong to him? Luke 6, 13 says, And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. And of them he chose twelve, from whom he named apostles. Psalm 78, 70, Old Testament. He chose David, also his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So you've got to realize, even if you're on the backside of a desert, take care of a few sheep, God sees you. A lot of times in life, I wonder, God, do you see me working in this RC Cola plant, stacking these drinks? Do you see me flipping burgers at the Sonic? Do you see me carrying a shotgun downtown San Antonio, working for a security company, driving people out of this hotel? Do you see me here in obscurity? And God says, I see you. I saw David when he was in the sheepfold. He saw you coaching. Uh, coach, he sees us wherever we're at. He watched you over Chick-fil-A being nice to people, Mercedes. Amen. God sees you. And you got to realize, I'm not obscure. Amen. He sees what I do. Even if I'm by myself, God is still seeing me, just like he did David. That's why when uh, Samuel came in and said, which one of these boys is going to be the next king? He said, none of these guys are going to do it. None of these brothers. And Jesse said, I got a little son. I'll take care of sheep. Did you know God had already chose him before he came in? Then I can actually walk you back in Scripture and realize that God told Samuel that I have found a man after my own heart. When he said that, David had yet to be born. How is it a man that has yet to be born, God said, I found him after my own heart. And all the mess-ups that David had in life, he was still a man after God's own heart. He loved God. Yeah, he made me. Uh, that, that's what makes so many of us, particularly men, look toward David when we realize our own failures in life. That we can still have a heart after God and believe Him for His mercies and grace. It doesn't excuse us. Amen? But it does tell us that this man had that heart. And because it, God said, I found a man after my own heart. And Samuel said, where is he? I, I, I'll, I'll introduce you to him in 15 years. And so what happens is Jesse jumps a fence and gets with another woman and has David. So has these seven boys. This is why it's so important to me. Because many people think because you're illegitimate, that's the word we use, Amen. You you were adopted. 
amen, that you, you, you were in a place of life where your parents had you at an old, they were in an old, a Larry King saga, amen. And you say, well, they're, you know, that's 75, 80 year old when I had the kid. That doesn't matter. God intended for you to be here. Amen. And intentionally, I don't care if it's in a 15, 16 year old, it doesn't matter. God intended. So when you make up your mind that God chose you and loves you, amen, it's just everything in your life. Hallelujah. Because love, love's going to win out all, all around. He loves us. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6, amen, verse 19, you're not your own. Uh, for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So he loves his own. He paid a price for you. You can find God's own working in a workplace, amen, fishing in a boat, amen, collecting taxes, hanging out among the poor, sitting around behind a desk, amen. There are those that have been forgotten, that are his own for, forsaken. They are his own rejected, but his own ridiculed, but still his own. Amen. John chapter 13, verse 4 says, He rose from supper. He laid aside his garments. Got up from supper. Let me just say it like this. He stood, he stooped, he stripped, and he served. He stood, he stooped, he stripped, and served. He stood, he stooped, he stripped, he served. After he rose from supper, he laid aside his garments. He took a towel and girded himself. That's what that is. I'm girded now. Amen. <laughs> he girded himself, and after that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Love, love reveals itself through demonstration. Don't tell me you love me unless you can demonstrate it. Amen. Show me something. Show me something. Show, show the world you love them. Amen. That lay aside your garments, gird up with a towel, and wash their car. Mow their grass. Do something for them. Fix a spot on their roof. Amen. May, maybe a busted pipe every now and then. Can I get an amen? Amen. By the way, everybody in Colorado knew y'all had busted pipes. That's funny. That's how did you get busted? Yeah, okay. So what we do reveals our love for one another. He stood, he rose. But through the idea of collecting one's faculties, he rose from inactivity, obscurity. He stepped out of the vagueness of their mind to the forefront of their heart. In other words, they're, 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 they're circled around, they're taking communion, excuse me, amen. Uh, they, they, they're taking communion, and then he got up. When he got up, all their attention looked at him. They're observing him at this moment. What is he going to do? Now, we, we understand he's talking about death, but we understand he's talking about uh, laying his body down. But what is he fixing to do? And then he stooped down. He humbled himself. And this blows my mind. We're talking about the God of the universe. I don't care how you divide the Godhead. Amen. But understand that God created the earth with a voice. In the beginning was the Word. Amen. The Word was God. The Word was with God. And we realize the Word of God was Jesus Amen. Rama walking around speaking the word of God. So here he is, God himself, stupid. Amen. Considered himself. And this is what blows my mind. Many a believer in Christ will not humble themselves. We won't serve one another. There's an arrogance about us. It's like, you know, it's, it's all about me. You know what that is? That exposes your insecurity. That exposes things in your life when you can't serve somebody else. Amen. You've got to be able to say, you know what? I'm secure enough to humble myself. Take your plate, look after you, bring you a drink, uh, what I can do for you. Because in life, that's what love does. That's what love does. So he rose up, amen, then he stooped, he humbled himself. It's a word picture here as a helper, unselfish, thought, he, he was full of thoughtfulness. And then he stripped, he uncovered, only those you love. Let me say this to you again. Only those you love or who love you, you can reveal yourself to. I'm bothered when people go and tell all that stuff to everybody. Amen. I, you know, there's an old saying, hey, hey, that's, uh, I'll share with you mine if you share with me yours. You know, I like to have a little something on you before I'm going to tell you about me. Got to get an amen? And love covers a multitude of sins and mistakes. So Jesus, he began to uncover, amen, and then he served. He began to serve them. He gave them the bread and he gave them the wine. Amen. Your ability to create unity is directly related to your ability to be a servant. Let me say it again. 
Your ability to create unity is directly related to your ability to be a servant. It changes the atmosphere. The atmosphere was smug. The atmosphere was arrogant. But when Jesus began to serve, they began to break down. It's amazing what it does. Amen. When you begin to serve one another, when you begin to, to understand I can do this thing, it's a powerful dimension. Let me start closing here. Amen. Nothing changes an atmosphere like serving. He loved them unto the end. I mentioned to you in 1 Corinthians 13. Was that 1 Corinthians or 2? It was 1, didn't it? 1 Corinthians 13. That love forgives, love covers, love never fails, love doesn't hold no act of wrong. I want to mention to you, when Jesus said, whoever I give the sock to is the one that's going to betray me. And I'm going to promise you that those 12 disciples didn't see it coming. The 11, they didn't understand what was happening. They still didn't understand what was happening. Jesus actually said, I'm going to give this to whoever's going to betray me. And then he gives it to Judas. And we'll talk more about Judas later. But Judas goes out into the night and gets 30 pieces of silver and betrays the Christ. In my heart, in my understanding, in my study, I believe that Judas thought that he could take the silver, that Jesus would not be crucified, that he would walk through like he always had. Amen. But it didn't happen that way. And then, of course, you know about Judas throwing the silver back into the temple. He went out and hung himself. I've often used the phrase, it was night and never became day again for him. Amen. It began to fold that way. The issue for me is how much love he has for us. Some of you have felt like failures. I have. I know you have. I know many watching online have. You feel like, how could God love me? How could he care about me? I tell you again, love will move through in interruptions, distractions, all type of things to reach and to help and bless others. You know, people... They can't help it. They're going to disappoint you. But God will never disappoint you. Amen. That's why I put my trust in him. Amen. The word end, he loved him unto the end, means to set out for a definite point or goal, the point aimed at as a limit, the ultimate or prophetic purpose. But before I close on this, I want to mention this. Everything that blessed the disciples came through Christ. That after the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Christ, they didn't quit. Peter goes on to preach the gospel. A thousand got saved. James preaches the gospel. He gets beheaded. John keeps preaching the gospel because he loved Jesus. He knew Jesus loved him. And he, he's literally put into a vat of oil and boil. And then they excommunicated him and put him on an island called Patmos where Jesus comes to visit him and gives him the book of Revelation. You follow where I'm going? So ministry has such a powerful impact in your life that once you've been touched, James, once you've been blessed, once you understand that God loves you, it's not the end of anything. It's the beginning of great things. And you continue to do it. That's why I tell people, I, you know, this everything that's blessed in my life actually came through ministry. It came through the church. My family, my adopted children, everything I've got seems to have come through ministry. It comes with serving God and staying with it. Somebody said, Pastor, why, why do you give? Why do you tithe? First, I want to honor God. Second, I do it because ministry has been such a blessing to me. It's more than just uh, I get to serve. I get to serve people. What a blessing. What a joy to serve people. Amen. When, when before I was selfish, I was all about me. Everything was me, 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 amen. And then I get born again, and I find that the people I'm supposed to hate, I can't hate them. I have no hatred in my heart toward folk, amen. I have no hatred toward uh, nationality, toward culture. As a matter of fact, the longer I live, the more I want to know about culture. I want to know about why you think the way you think, amen, why you do what you do. And I find that some people are kind of curious about me. So I share what about my life and my culture and where I came from. Romans 8, and I close with this. Who's going to separate you from the love of Jesus? Pastor, you don't understand. I think God's mad at me. Maybe for a little while. But I promise you, he's going to get over it quicker than you will. Amen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The tribulation? Distress, 
virus, I added that one. Persecution, famine, no clue. Nakedness, no clue. Peril, sword, somebody tried to kill me. As it is written, for your sake we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When I read this, it just begins to blow up inside me. There is nothing. I am persuaded, Paul said, that death, death can't separate me. Things that go on in this life can't separate me. Angels, demons, amen, principalities, powers, things present, things to come. Nothing will separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Pastor, how you know you're going to heaven? Because nothing will separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. And this is so important because I see people giving up over the littlest things. And here is a man who'd been shipwrecked, who'd been beaten, who'd been uh, sold to death. God raised back from the grave. And he stood with confidence and said, you know what? Nothing's going to separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. So when Jesus talked to his disciples, he said, I'm going to tell you something, boys. No matter what goes on here, as I move toward the cross, nothing will separate me from you. Now, later on, you find that after Jesus dies on the cross, he's in the, uh, in the tomb. The disciples get despair. They get discouraged. They're going to hide out in the room. They're looking to think that the Romans are going to break in and kill them. And who walks through the wall? But Jesus. What a comfort. What a joy. You know what he did? He reminded them again. Boys, I love you. And they went and turned the world upside right. Amen. Now it's our turn. John, before he passed, wrote chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give you. Love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. I hate the fact that he's got to say, but. By this all men will know that you are my. Hold on. All people know you are my disciples if you got a bumper sticker. If you're wearing a cross around your neck. All people will know you are my disciples if you got a Jesus shirt on. You know, there are times that I feel really convicted about wearing a Jesus shirt. When my mouth should have said what it said. Amen. Ain't nothing like somebody flipping you off. You got a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker. All men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Religions all around the world have different values, but only Christianity carries this one punch that we are brothers and sisters because we love one another. We love the least. We love the greatest. We love the down and out. We love the misfits. We love one another. And when you love one another, you're showing Christ's love to the world. We've got to get back to what the Scripture teaches us. So can we change the world? I don't know if I can change the world, but I can change my world by keeping on loving. You know the hardest people you've got to love, Marie, is your family. Yes, your family. Amen. They're a family that they're hard to love. But I'm going to tell you something. I love them. I love my family. Oh, I love them. I love my friends. I, and I, I've got to learn to love my enemies. The problem is, my enemies won't show me who they are just yet. But I'm sure they're going to manifest soon. Amen? Because they always do. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for a change of Flow over us right now. Oh, God, move hate away from us. Take apathy from us. Fill us with the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Remind us of how much you love. Lord, if we can weep over a, a, a dog or a cat on TV in a commercial so full of emotion, why can't we weep for one another? Why can't we hurt for the humans around us? 
God, help us to have not just an empathy, but a sympathy and a desire to connect with others. God, to reach for people. God, as you have reached for us. Nothing's going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the love. Of overflow us in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I can't make you laugh. Amen. But I could probably make you hate. Isn't that weird? That somebody could make you hate. I can't make you love. But he can. You got to decide to love one another. In Jesus' name. Amen. Is there a limit to his love? No. No, it's hinged on to his destiny. Hallelujah. In front of you, I did mention a little bit about giving. You know, I do. My giving has nothing to do with anything other than honor God and an appreciation for ministry. I love the house of God. Amen. I love the people of God. So my giving reflects that. Amen. So make sure that you do that today in your giving. There will be buckets in the back of the building as you pass by. Hallelujah. And I think the, uh, uh, and I, online you can also, there's an opportunity for you to give for those that are watching. Amen. You can go to holywild.net slash give. Amen. We thank you for the online giving. There are people that watch us all over, all over the United States. Thank God for that. Amen. A lot of good stuff coming up. We've got kids camp coming up in July. My pastor will not be able to be here next month. Amen. Because of some situations in his own family. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Raggedy. Thank you, Brother Raggedy. You know what? I love, don't fix this. Don't grab my coat and try to fix it. I love the frazzles in this coat. It reminds me how much I weigh. Amen. When I die, put me in it for just a little while and then see me. Okay. Amen. David, come on up here. Now, you keep making announcements about stuff like that. Yeah, I was in a snowstorm. <laughs> Bless me. Will you give me pastor some love? Storm, but we're glad he made it down. Amen. Look, like March 21st, we have a lift lady.